uh, would like to welcome, welcome everyone to this panel with this uh, topic on values, ethics, and social impact in education. Um, as you can see, uh, I'm now talking to the audience as well. Uh, we have participants and panelists from around the world, which is very nice. We have Alberto Zucconi from Italy, uh, Cheng Yiheng from China, Hazel from the US, Janani from India, and Lena from Denmark. So this is always, I think, important that, that people have, although we are all internationally, I'm sure, oriented, but still we are grounded in our um, at least one or, or a few cultures and um, environments, right, in, in, in every sense of the word. Okay, so um, you, you have also seen that there is, a, there is a short abstract to this panel. And um, basically, I would just like to, uh, to bring it up in short, uh, just for those who, who have not read it, and also just to kind of remind ourselves what we will be talking about. So the Academy's founders were motivated by the realization that science and arts have an imperative responsibility to ensure that the creations of the human mind should promote the security, welfare, and well-being of humanity. This session will explore the importance of values, ethics, social impact, and social responsibility in higher education. It will also try to identify ways to more fully integrate the values of objective science and subjective elements of arts and human sciences into the content and pedagogy of all disciplines. So uh, uh, I would like to now invite Hazel uh, to speak about her thoughts, experiences on this topic, and then also our four panelists. Later in the second part of the panel, we will proceed in a way that we will ask two questions, uh, the, the two of us as moderators, maybe two or three questions that we think are important, and uh, we will ask our panelists to respond or comment on them. So please, Hazel, would you, would you proceed? Thank you, my co-moderator, Vesna. <laughs> so again, as an outsider, I really have to, I have to, to say that I never went to college. And so I know very little about um, the inside workings of the educational institutions around the world. Although I have tremendous respect for the success of the Cartesian reductionist development of knowledge, uh, the basis of which um, we are resting right now. And where we are now at the point where we have to reintegrate all of those silos and uh, separate departments. And uh, that's really, I think the issue, how we uh, reform or at least bring these institutions together um, around the new threats really uh, to humanity. And so now the issue is how do we educate humanity, um, which is the, our best hope for survival. I mean, there, there's nothing left now but educating humanity and uh, widening um, the perception of uh, a large population all over the world uh, of the main uh, conditions of our survival. And it's really very simple. We're hearing it from our children all the time. And, you know, it's basically that we are one species. We know that from our DNA. Uh, we also have 2% of our DNA um, is uh, from Neanderthals. So we have to remember that. <laughs> and not only are we one species, um, uh, but our survival also depends on all other species in the biosphere and protecting the biosphere. And the other condition of our survival is that we all live on a planet, the third from our mother star, the sun, and we rely every day on the free flow of photons from, from the sun, and uh, which provides our food supply 
Um, and uh, the first technology on the planet, of course, was developed by plants, and that is photosynthesis. And so we are still totally reliant on plants and photosynthesis for our means of survival, food, energy, everything. And so that's the meta story that, that we have to educate uh, in now. And building on all the wonderful disciplines and all the knowledge we have developed in so many areas, uh, but the main framework, uh, I believe, has to be that story about how we survive. And, and so my self-education um, was always experiential. And I, I began as an environmental activist in New York City in the mid 1960s, starting, I was a new, newly uh, naturalized American citizen. And I started a group called Citizens for Clean Air. And here we are 50 years later, realizing that air pollution in our cities causes um, about 9 million excess deaths a year. Uh, and so I began very simply to reach out to other organizations. I mean, I reached out to a group in California called Stamp Out Smog. Um, we communicated. I reached out to Ralph Nader and joined his campaign to make General Motors responsible. Since we found that General Motors was creating 30% of all of the air pollution in New York City from the tailpipes, of its cars. Um, and, and so uh, basically uh, I joined uh, with all of these groups to launch Earth Day in 1970. And that led in uh, the USA to the signing in 1970 of the Clean Air Act. And for the first time as a new citizen, I'm invited to the White House and I have, I have the honor of shaking hands with President Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> so, so this whole thing uh, is, uh, is very, uh, ex so experiential. And I suddenly found myself uh, in 1975 as a cabinet level science policy advisor to the US Office of Technology Assessment, which was founded to anticipate the second order consequences of all of these profit-driven technologies, um, which were coming out willy-nilly um, uh, and using all of these brilliant technological uh, knowledge that we created, but purely for profitable purposes. And so my role, um, it seemed, on the Technology Assessment Advisory Council to the US Congress and also to the National Science Foundation and the National Academy of Engineering um, was to question the ethics and the values around these technological choices and to look at all of the groups in society um, who had no uh, interest in the development of these technologies, but was suffering all the impacts, the social and environmental consequences, uh, whether it was labor unions or consumer groups or environmentalists or poor people, they had no say in any of this. And so uh, the Office of Technology Assessment uh, became so good um, at integrating um, the scientific disciplines with all of the social and ethical disciplines. And we, we brought in anthropologists and sociologists and we are they were all interdisciplinary teams looking at these various uh, technologies. And they were all, all of the issues of the day were systemic. And we absolutely, of course, um, had to rise above the market and money. And of course, markets and money are both wonderful human inventions going back thousands of years. We have always used money, whether it was shells or wampum or whatever. 
Um, and we have always used markets. We love to trade. Humans have always loved to trade and exchange with each other. But these had become uh, sort of weaponized uh, during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and um, uh, basically what I encountered um, from the academic uh, community where we used to bring in consultants from all of these universities all over the US and I coined the, uh, the term intellectual mercenaries. And I have to say that was what they were. Um, they, they were um, in the uh, consultants to corporations. And, and so the whole thing for me became corporate social responsibility. And then I got into the whole thing of critiquing the discipline of economics. And I was called um, in one public relations journal, the most dangerous woman in America. And I was sort of thrilled about that. Um, and I kept critiquing economics, particularly the fact that it wasn't a science, it was a discipline, there's nothing wrong with a profession, but don't call yourself a science. And so I joined with Peter Nobel uh, in Sweden, and he and I wrote, he was a descendant of Alfred Nobel, who understood very well that economics was not a science. And so we uh, wrote articles together, you know, in, for Agence France Press and uh, uh, Le Monde Diplomatique, uh, talking about um, why do we allow this phony Nobel Prize which actually is uh, set up by the Central Bank of Sweden to try to legitimize economics as if it were a science. And we've been trying to uncover that fraud and it, it took 10 years to uncover that fraud. Now the family of the Nobel uh, com uh, committee um, has dissociated itself from the Bank of Sweden prize. So see this whole thing really is about politics. And um, so we have to deal now with the financialization um, which is really causing most of the social and environmental destruction around the world because the model is the price system. All of the metrics from GDP, to all, all of the economic metrics, which are based on the price system, which are driving us all over the cliff. And, and so basically um, we need a new model of globalization. Um, and of course, that's why I'm very supportive of the UN and the SDGs. And the other last point I would make um, is that what we're seeing now is self-credentialization. And all over the world, the young people and the people at uh, COP26 and all of the, the activists in the climate movement um, credentialize themselves as the way I did. I called myself a futurist because I was being attacked because people were saying I, I was a socialist. I, I don't know what that means. I'm a futurist, you know. So it is, I wanted to just throw out those challenges to begin our conversation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> okay, great, hey, Hazel. This is a, um, a very good introduction for our panel and, and it's so inspiring to hear uh, all, all that you went through and what you fought for. And also how, how long ago you started some things which came yeah. up as the crucial ones today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, now we will we will proceed with our um, other participants, the panelists. Uh, Alberto, uh, would you tell us something about this topic? Yes, uh, and first of all, Vesna, allow me to give a, a heartfelt thank, thanking Hazel for having been the most dangerous woman. Uh, by just speaking the truth. Uh, we need uh, so many more today and tomorrow. Uh, I'll use uh, my five minutes uh, underlining uh, something uh, I feel of the utmost uh, importance uh, if uh, we're going to deal effectively with the mounting challenge uh, that uh, humanity has to face. And it's uh, the topic of this session 
ethics. I think uh, that uh, ethics uh, need to be one of the drivers, one of the cardinal points uh, of the compass uh, for surviving and prospering, uh, facing uh, effectively the present challenge. We need uh, to, and that's uh, where education comes in. Um, <laughs> it's very eloquent in my mind uh, that uh, Hazel, you could do all the contribution uh, never going to school. No, you went to school, but uh, your university was life itself. I think uh, we should learn uh, from your example of uh, accomplished uh, woman uh, and uh, scholar. I think uh, that, uh, and uh, uh, I was present uh, representing the World Academy of Art and Science uh, and the World University Consortium in uh, uh, the 26th of September of 2014, where we launched the Postnam Declaration. Janani and me, we wanted to invite Leonard, that is one of our fellow, one of the main people in the Karolinska Institute, a main mover for the whole of university promotional social capital, health and development. In this declaration that the, the first uh, uh, organization to endorse it were the World Academy and uh, the World University Consortium. And then uh, five minutes later, also the Compostela group, uh, about uh, 85 universities around the world in uh, you know, Spanish language. What do we say? We need that when we train the new citizen of tomorrow, when we train the new professional, that in every degree, ethics and value have a significant presence. Because without that compass, we go in blind and the sad state of the world, the sad state of how we use our knowledge, our science, uh, is uh, really dramatically underlined that need. So I think uh, that not to teach uh, ethics at any level of schooling, of education, but starting also in the family, uh, starting in all the social construction uh, that is done in the institution that we call society is a big luck and a big mistake. Actually, more, and I will conclude that because time is fast, we are in Kronos and not in Kairos, that not to teach ethics always in school is an underlying some value that ethics are not important. Or like Hazel Henderson, ethics and value in school are dangerous because then people could make their own judgment about the behavior of institution, first of all, of academia. So I really thank uh, again uh, Lennon Levy, one of our uh, cherished fellow, and uh, uh, I hope uh, that uh, we can uh, offer a compass where science is united with the value, transparent and congruent value, and uh, deontology, uh, the only way to go ahead uh, without being blind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Yes, uh, this is one of the crucial problems and, and the things that we could be thinking about along the way. Thank you, Alberto. Uh, so now our second speaker is Lene Rachel Anderson. Lene, thank you please. very much. And <laughs> thank you for inviting me for this amazing panel. So I decided to bring a very advanced piece of uh, audiovisual uh, equipment here, uh, which includes this pen because I would like to make a drawing. 
And I developed a model called the Bildung Rose. And I want to talk about Bildung. And I'm just going to write it for those who are not uh, German speakers. So it's called B-I-L-D-U-N-G. And it, it's about the build, the image in which you shape yourself and you evolve as a human being. And the easiest way to describe Bildung is to say it's two kinds of knowledge, the easily transferable kind of knowledge. So that is what we usually learn in school, it can be academic, language, math, and so forth, but it can also be how to bake a bread or fix a bicycle. And then there's the other kind of knowledge, which is the emotional development, the moral development, the deep connections into culture and social fabric. And Bildung is both, both of them. But the drawing, is an image of society. And I'm gonna make a claim now that all societies have the following, production, technology, aesthetics, we can call it art for the sake of the occasion today. All societies have power, can be the simplest hunter-gatherer society with shaman, but it can also be the most complex democratic or non-democratic high-tech society. And all societies also have uh, science or at least facts about the world. In the modern world, we also have a process for it. That's why we call it science. But all societies have facts about the world that help them survive. And all societies have narrative. Mm -hmm. And that is the stories about who, what, what makes a good person. This is where our moral values are embedded. So this can be religion, it can be political ideology. It can also be history from a scientific point of view because we always edit history, even if we're scientists who are trying to figure out what history was like. And then there is the final one here, which is ethics. And I call the model the Bildung Rose because the way it is constructed, I'm just gonna create a little bit of colorful here is that there's the power in the center that should take care that everything else is balanced. And then we got, as society becomes more complex, each of these um, domains specialize and become more complex as well. And the challenge for education is that everybody gets all of this. This is the horizontal kind of knowledge that we all need. And the way that I constructed the model is that everything up here is what is what we can do here and now, what's possible here and now. What is down here, art, power, and science, that is where we ought to explore what things could be like. And down here, narrative and ethics, that is where we explore what the world ought to be like. And the difference that I have between narrative and moral values and ethics is that moral values are what teach us how to behave in familiar situations. Ethics teach us or can guide us in unfamiliar situations. And with the te technological development that we have right now, we need to consult ethics, the principles behind our values and moral values, because we're facing new situations that we've never been in before. And one of the challenges that we're facing with the current educational system is that we've sent all the resources to production and tech and the, I mean, economics and the making of money is up here as well. Whereas we are starving the fundamental sciences, the arts, uh, the creation of new political institutions in a globalized world with internet and all the new technologies. And we're definitely also in the modern and particularly the postmodern world, starving the narrative and ethics. And from, I would say, kindergarten to PhD, everybody should explore all seven domains and struggle with them. And if you struggle with them and fail and learn and struggle, that is when you have the moral and emotional development that is the vertical development. If we look at this, I mean, this is a picture of society. The way that you make sense of society is that you learn some of all of it in the society that you're in. And of course, in the globalized world, we all need to learn a lot more. If we look at it as the horizontal kind of knowledge that we can transfer from one person to the next, uh, the power, the center in this one, in the individual, is the personal power over yourself. 
and over your decision making, over your actions in the world. So any any level of education should have all of this, and I think that was very much. Mm -hmm. Great, Lana. Uh, thank, thank you very you. much. Where where can we? Re did you write? Did you publish on this, or this is very new? Yeah. <laughs> you you did. No, I, I it's I I can share a couple of links. Yeah. Okay, that would be nice. I'm sure that many uh, would like to, including Good, myself, yes. would, would like to to read uh, and and to better study. Although I took notes, but you know, <laughs> to better study all these um, aspects and links between them and so on. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we proceed to uh, uh, um, Cheng Yiheng, our colleague from China. So please. <laughs> hey, oh, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, well. I actually try <clears throat> to uh, find a way um, to think where Hazel started with the Futurist. So in 1974, when I went to Germany and study, um, I came across Club of Rome, a group of Futurists. Uh, that was amazing. And um, I started looking at that. So when I became a member of Club of Rome, that was 2013, so almost 60. So I went out when I was 20, when I'm looking for Club of Rome, that was the age. And when I became a member was 60. Um, what I have uh, got, the first book was Limit to Growth and used five factors. That's the uh, resources, population, production, well, industrial production, and food production, and the last one was pollution. So with that five questions, Club of the, um, the Limit to Growth shown us, there was a pattern which were run like resources is limited and all the others will have, a, will have uh, run through a peak. And it happened in 2050 was peak for population or the rest well, start earlier. So important, uh, interesting enough is that everything was predicted 50 years ago, but we still run to that end 50 years later. So in 2012, another book came out from Gabarron as a report. That was 2052. So 40 years later in 2012, and then another book. Well, the model it was a uh, role model 1.0 with this uh, simulation or dynamic simulation. And in 2012, we got another uh, uh, dynamic model that was 3.0. So are we, I, I will ask myself and say that, are we repeating the same thing and predicting a world which is more precise and we still run into that? So that is what was my question. Okay, uh, in the last 50 years, what was positive was through the technological improvement, the resources became uh, much more than we thought. There are the limited growth has presented because of the technology investment uh, in advancement. What negative is there are so many other factors which was not predicted became so dominant. For example, CO2 or the pandemic. So shouldn't we ask a different way and look at the five factors, pollution, uh, population, not looking at how many people we can still feed, like, well, 9 billion people and uh, is, uh, all the resources what are left, which we can use, or the pollutions which are, um, newly invented or newly considered and whatever and with reach to, to limit all the things. And think a different way and, and uh, ask us, what really do we want? Looking at the question of population. Maybe what we want is the population will grow in a rational way and human beings will live happily and healthy. Well. There's a different way of asking questions. With that, then you have actually coming out certain things or certain factors which 
uh, we don't have today or we have been facing or we are working on different ways. So you have to see the differences or the gap and trying to get, drag that through education. Maybe that's a better way. And then I look at um, the differences between Eastern and Western. Are there differences? So that I can find, I, or it, it seems to me that the collective consciousness is much dominant. Look at what happened in the last uh, World War, or even the dominating factors which uh, happened in China, cultural revolution, or even now at the pandemic. So it's not individual, individual culture is presenting, but, or individual persons presenting, but a collective consciousness in the region, in the country, in the global. So that, if I combine the uh, Chinese culture and saying that, already described uh, 2000 years ago by Confucianism, saying that human beings have to learn from 30 to 70. And with that process, I think education should bring people, keep them open and stay changeable. That's the critic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, yes, these are these are uh, quite um, yeah complex questions. Um, thank you for bringing them out. And of course, uh, comparing East and West, there's a lot to say about that. So I hope maybe in our discussion later on, uh, these, these aspects will be mentioned. Okay, so we have another speaker, uh, uh, the, the fourth one, Janani Ramanathan. Uh, would you please uh, tell us what your thoughts? Thank you. Okay. This is a headline that appeared in the New York Times. Superficial, sudden, unsifted, too fast for the truth. This could apply to WhatsApp or Twitter, but actually this is from 1858 about the telegraph. What stands out is how people have always been concerned about the risk that you know superficial, unsifted information poses. The New Yorker Times news item, it continues, that there is no question that the telegraph will be of very great use, but how will its use add to the happiness of mankind? The founding of the World Academy itself was out of this concern, actually. And, and, and we do see today any scientific or social development is accompanied by a debate of its you know, larger impact on society. When a vaccine is developed, there is a call to make it a common good. Uh, when space tourism begins, along with the excitement, is the opposition asking if it is really necessary now when we have more you know, pressing concerns? Regardless of, of any debate, one thing is for sure, there is no stopping or, or slowing down this advancement of knowledge, of, of scientific technological development and its impact. It, it's sometimes just hard to keep track of what is being released, what's being published, let alone you know, analyze it. So. How do you control what is out there, be it information or product or service, which may be, you know, backed by, you know, very powerful vested interests? One way to control is this, is I believe from, from within. When we develop in each young person, the, the discretion, the values, the ethics, and a consciousness of one's wider you know, responsibilities, somewhat like you know, Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. And I believe an education that uh, makes ethics and values an integral part of learning can, can create uh, this change. And uh, we have some you know, distilled what we call science of all that is subjective, what is uh, you know, quantifiable, replicable, and you know, empirical has a status that the subjective dimension of life does not have in our uh, education, but life is an integration of these two aspects of reality, the objective and the subjective. We have introduced a dichotomy and we see its consequences in all the challenges that we face. Even in our efforts to tackle COVID, there is the science of the vaccine and methods of prevention, but we see the science is not enough. We need people's cooperation, their trust. We need to handle their fears and suspicion, indifference. 
And so in order to integrate these uh, aspects in our life, I believe our, our thinking has to be integrated. And that starts with an education that is uh, person-centered and value-based. And if we can do that, when our future citizens are you know, centered around the well-being of all, I believe no matter what the, the, the nature and the pace of any development, values and ethics will have their place. And, and uh, that can go a long way in ensuring universal human welfare. And I'd just like to conclude that uh, with, with uh, the lead from Alberto, we have, uh, start, we have this WAS code of ethics now, which is a, a step in the right direction. I'll post more details about that in our chat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Janani. Uh, yes, this is coming back to, to this, um, well, artificial actually split, split between objective and subjective. And, and then it continues in, you know, in the split between arts and sciences and then also human sciences and, and uh, even social, social sciences um, and not to speak about natural and technological ones. So um, yes, these are important topics. Now uh, we will we will go on to the let's say second part of our session, and I would like Hazel to ask her question, her main question, and then afterwards I will ask mine. <laughs> Thank you, Vesna. Well, the the a key question for me, particularly with this group, since I've raised it already. Um, have any of you in your societies seen uh, an, org an institution, a government institution, such as the U.S. Office of Technology Assessment? And the reason I ask that is that during its short lifetime from 1975 to 1996, when it was shut down by Republicans um, who were absolutely terrified of the reports, that we were producing <laughs> so they killed the messenger but at that uh, in between we found in 40 countries they had copied the idea of having an anticipatory group in the public sector to look at the second order consequences likely from privately uh, developed technologies for profit purposes. So anyone um, ever heard of that in any of your countries? Very, that's very interesting. See, so, I can say no. so they did slay the messenger very effectively. <laughs> and luckily enough, um, they all of these reports like we did a report um, in 1981, which we have republished with the University of Florida Press. We found the University of Florida Press, our partner, um, has all of these studies electronically, and you can go in and get them free. Uh, if you want to download them or buy them as a book, you know, they may be about $40, but you can read them on your Kindle. And so we published, we republished one, which I was particularly fond of, and I helped foster that. Uh, it was published in 1981, and it's called Assessing, Assessment of Technologies for Local Development. And uh, you can find it free download on our websites at ethicalmarkets.com. And basically, I did a new introduction to it, um, pointing out that it started the small is beautiful revolution. Uh, and it could have been written yesterday. It was all about um, community owned solar energy, uh, wind farms, community um, assisted agriculture, uh, community common housing and local currencies and uh, farmers markets and all the things that now um, are very chic and um, fashionable in the USA uh, in 2021. And of course, uh, being driven largely by the lockdown that we have all experienced uh, due to COVID. Um, this has meant a reconsideration of community and uh, 
I think that that's one of the reasons why last, uh, the last report uh, um, from the uh, Economic Institute in the US that 4 million Americans uh, simply quit the labor force and decided, uh-uh, our time is more valuable now than a minimum wage job um, you know, uh, in a hotel or something like that. And uh, uh, we are going to quit because we realize it's at the time of our lives that is more valuable than money. So some very fundamental changes happened, um, I think, because of COVID. And that can, added to climate change has been a very big kick in the pants for humans in almost every society. And anyone have any thoughts on that? Maybe just uh, one uh, comment on uh, in the Chinese thinking, never be the first one. <laughs> so um, it's very interesting, especially the technology and Taoism. Uh, and from actually from 2000 years, Chinese do have a lot of inventions, but all these inventions is quite settled down through proving um, the people using that more often and more, et cetera. So no one actually create a new thing and try out and see what happens. And this, um, and until today, I still see that um, as a disadvantage maybe in the world today, but on the other hand, uh, they will never do the first one especially nuclear, whatever, you, you, you name it, all the new technologies. 5G is a different way because it's a new move again. So the new China, the, 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 where we are trying to become, because they were forced to do that. If you don't do that, you have no chance. Then you will be forced. Yeah? But in the last almost 2,000 or 3,000 or even 5,000 years, Chinese has that saying, don't be the first one. Interesting. Too dangerous. You are cause more problem than you create solve solutions. Well, okay. Thank you. Um, can I say my question, or and then we can because it kind of comes, it widens the maybe the the, the, the platform, but it's very much connected to to everything we said. I would uh, okay. I would like you to comment if you wish on on the following. Uh, could social and human sciences uh, enable the emergence and development of an ideology leading to a system which is participatory, decentralized, federalistic, democratic, ecological, non-racist, that also means non-colonialist, and feminist. Many words are present here, but... Uh, this is actually a quote from a new book of somebody who is probably well known to you, which whose name I will say later on. <laughs> and he call, he has a name for this system, but I, I, I liked it. I liked it. And this is the way I, 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 I kind of also think about these things. Now, in the, in the center of the, all this is ideology. So the question, just to, to rephrase it is, could now uh, social and human sciences, because usually when we, when we talk about this, topic of our panel, usually we, we first think of the technology, new technologies and their threats, and how possibly uh, human social sciences can kind of um, help in balancing, in, 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 in controlling these threats. But now I'm putting forward, I'm putting away a little bit the, these natural and, and um, technological sciences and putting in focus social and human sciences. And actually, uh, most of you here, or us here, except uh, Yi Hang, are social or human, let's say, scientists or thinkers or whatever. Uh, so that's why I, I think uh, I would like to hear your opinion on the importance of ideology, I'm working on an ideology uh, as, as some kind of a collective um, uh, trans-ideological effort <laughs> where we could think about the system which would be 
all these things, participatory, decentralized, you know, democratic, ecological, non-racist, and non-feminist. Because even though the society has progressed in certain ways on these issues, uh, it seems that there are some step backs in it as well. And even if we talk about progress in some way or developments, it's far away from being um, acceptable for the humanity for the future. Okay, so this is my question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Alberto, I think, was first, and then Lene. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead, uh, Lene. Go ahead. Go first. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, I, I mean, I'm always afraid when somebody says, can we create one ideology? Um, <laughs> I would rather have that we have a lot of ideologies and that all people, instead of being captured by one ideology where the ideology has the person, each individual has many you know, uh, ideologies, uh, viewpoints, experiences, cultural roots, so that the personality of the individual becomes that individual truly and fully. And then we have the conversation about, so what would be the right thing to do? Um, and the question is, can we create educational systems for that personal, and that would be the building part. Can we create better uh, institutions that allow the individuals to find their unique path in the world and where there are many ideologies um, and where we are all aware that we will never find the right ideology. Um, I could probably even come up with situations where I would be pro the patriarchy and against feminism. So uh, I'm not gonna spend time on that now. So I, I, would, I would wanna keep that uh, very open, but the process and the depth of knowledge um, I think is important and one, concrete suggestion that I would uh, bring about here is that everybody must have at least two educations so that you can use the perspectives of, of one education on the other professional field and the perspectives of that field on the other ones. And if that was you know, social sciences and computer technology or nanotechnology and um, painting, uh, the, I would be fine with that. That would be excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alberto? If I may, uh, also unite my uh, point uh, with the, what the Hazel was uh, asking. Well, first, uh, I agree with Ligny, but uh, I think uh, when uh, it's like uh, when people say, I I'm not political, uh, it's impossible to be political. In my opinion, the sociology of knowledge uh, show very simply, the reality is a social construction. And so we do not, uh, we humans, uh, live in reality. We live in the different uh, social construction of reality. By the way, in the Third International, there was a, a very sharp battle between uh, people that were thinking uh, that uh, we can do with less uh, state, uh, less uh, oppression, uh, and uh, trust the individual to be self-regulation. They were calling themselves uh, 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 anarcho-syndicalists, anarcho but uh, scientists like Kropotkin or Bernier in Malatesta, they were actually uh, defeated uh, by Marxist-Leninist, uh, and uh, in Spain, uh, the liberation brigades, uh, actually more of those uh, anarcho-syndicalists uh, died uh, with the bullet in their back uh, because uh, the order from Lenin uh, was to kill as many as possible of them. So we have been uh, always uh, trying uh, to merge uh, a trust in human being and self-regulation and people that do not uh, trust uh, the individual or people and think uh, that anything is possible because they are right. Uh, the religion wars are another example. I think uh, we always have, uh, and here I'll stop, a uh, great lesson to learn. This of uh, the pandemic of COVID-19 uh, would teach us uh, the obvious, that uh, to be egoist, uh, to be uh, stingy and not donate the vaccine uh, to third world country is so stupid and so inefficient. It's going to cost uh, us, a rich country, 
much more than donating uh, <laughs> so everybody is vaccinated and there are no mm -hmm. mutations. Also, you know, we all speak about uh, this pandemia, but uh, we've been having a, a damage of pandemia that is called racism, <laughs> uh, misogyny, social injustice. Uh, we are full of pandemia. And some uh, we are so used to that uh, we have become even uh, kind of blind. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think it was Janani and then Hazel. Uh -huh. Thank you. During the inaugural session yesterday, Dr. Irina Bukova men mentioned that uh, it is through knowledge of various cultures that we can be taught to you know, look upon diversity as something that adds strength to us rather than something that poses a threat. So I would just like to you know, go back to what, what Lenny just said about you know, several ideologies. Yes, we need several ideologies, educations, viewpoints. And, and I think you know, that way we will be able to see what otherwise might appear to be a, a threat as actually something that adds strength to us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to pick up from a comment in the chat box from Thomas Reuter in Australia. Mm -hmm. And um, he was talking about cooperation uh, really uh, as the only way forward. And uh, I definitely agree with that. But I, I would like to talk about um, uh, a well-accepted, not ideology, but a well-accepted set of principles that go back thousands of years. And uh, that is the golden rule, which if you go to Wikipedia, there's about 50 pages on the golden rule. Been in every language for thousands of years and every uh, major ethical leader, whether it was uh, Confucius or, um, or Jesus or Muhammad, uh, or the Buddha, all have accepted the idea of mutual interdependence, do as you would be done by. That was the first system statement that most human beings on this planet agreed to. And I constantly refer back to the agreement that we all made those thousands and thousands of years ago about the golden rule, because it relates to the need now to value the traditional societies of mutual aid and cooperation uh, and exchange that have always existed based on the golden rule um, and voluntary caring for each other. And these uh, societies all over the world are still larger than the GDP measured official uh, market sectors, uh, which they enfold. And if there's too much market, uh, it destroys them. So um, we need to value our love economies. And I am trying to not only bring this forward, that they are the path to our future. And we've already agreed on that set of principles. And fast forward to the year 1215 in England uh, with the Magna Carta, another great step forward where we had the writ of habeas corpus, where the king didn't own your body. You owned your own body. Everybody agrees to that, except of course, a lot of men don't agree that women own their own bodies <laughs> in many cultures. But basically that's simply, you know, the biological fact. And then you fast forward to 1948, uh, with the Eleanor Roosevelt's work on the UN Declaration of Human Rights, and then another advance in the year 2000, which was the 16 principles of the Earth Charter on human social responsibilities. You cannot have rights without responsibilities. So look, we are maturing. You know, we are a young species and we are growing out of our adolescent stage and we are maturing. And we will have to decide, the planet will decide whether we are a fit species to continue um, or whether we will simply become part of the sixth extinction, which is going on right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lena. 
I, I would like to add something about ownership because I'm currently reading a new book called The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber and uh, David Wengro. And I learned something there, which is that in many indigenous cultures, ownership means uh, the responsibility for stewardship. Um, whereas in Roman law, ownership uh, means the right to destroy something. So there, it, these are two radically different concepts of ownership. And there's a spiritual aspect to uh, the stewardship uh, or custodianship over land, resources, uh, relationships to, to other human beings and to culture. Um, so I, I just find it interesting that we in the West have based our uh, concept of ownership on actually the right to destroy things rather than uh, you know, improving them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we have, ah, uh -huh, yes, uh, yes, Yi Hung. Just one short sentence because uh, it's very uh, uh, difficult for me. Well, I have actually written a chapter in now in for, for, the, for the Club of Rome 50 years anniversary and I use a, a machine, which you know, the time waiver. Actually, I don't want us to be restricted to the words, to the terminology even to the Eastern or Western values. I don't think it's correct. Basically, human beings are human beings. Um, interesting enough, even with net factors, which I just uh, uh, spoken uh, about uh, the Club of Rooms, right? the, the population, and then we just say that uh, what we wish for and use that uh, values, whatever, you just say that nationalism, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, popularity or, uh, or plurality or whatever these things in there and, and use Chinese as a sentence or use English as another sentence um, with the same meaning, which I think from my, for myself, and I get actually interesting enough is whatever we have today will not fit in what we want in future. Mm -hmm. And this is what uh, is, uh, well, you study the history, but don't be dragged into the history. That, that's what I, I feel. So be open and changeable. Still, I think that's education, the, the, that's the spirit of the education. I, I, I think the skills or science or whatever. Yes, in the age of 70, basically you can learn any science. I mean, to me, it's, it's not a problem or any discipline. But are you still be open and changeable? That is a question. Well, this is a nice motto to, to finish off, but uh, okay, Hazel wants to add something. <laughs> and oh, then... Just one point. I'm trying to restore the word love mm -hmm. and um, make people understand the actual power of love. And if you read Petirim Sorokin's wonderful book, The Ways and Powers of Love, he was Lenin's secretary of culture, and he ended up as the chairman of the Department of Sociology at Harvard. That book has been republished from 1953, and I highly recommend it, The Ways and Powers of Love. And he has thousands of footnotes of examples of how love does conquer all. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. This is a very nice uh, way to round up our panel. Thank you for participating and thank you for everyone else who was with us.